Well, hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Samuel Singer, the founder and executive director of Wyoming Stargazing. Thanks for joining us on a uh, smoky uh, Sunday morning here in Jackson. Um, hopefully not so smoky evening in Germany, where our speaker is, um, but, um, but welcome. And um, yeah, we've got a fun presentation this morning um, by Dr. Anna Frankowiak from the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory and uh, the Zwicky Transient Facility. Um, stick around after her presentation uh, for the um, raffle prizes to win some astrophotography prints by uh, Mike Adler, who's actually joining us on the call right now. So Mike can even tell you a little bit about some of the prints that you win. Um, so yeah, stick around for that at the end. And um, with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Frankowiak and she can tell you all about Ice Cube. Thanks so much for being here, doctor. Hi everyone, uh, good morning. And well, I guess it's afternoon for me already. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Uh, I will tell you about my research on um, high energy neutrinos and uh, how we try to find their optical counterparts with the Zwicky transient facility. Um, I guess the, the way to do astronomy that, that you are used to is um, in the visible range. And if you're in a densely populated area, like I am at the moment, it probably looks like uh, the sky here above New York. You don't see much. But if you would imagine that you switch off all the lights in New York, it would look more like this. Um, and now we can imagine we make a, a sky map in the visible, you've probably seen this before. Um, so you see the Milky Way glowing bright in the middle, but you also see some structures of the gas that's basically uh, blocking the visible light coming from all the stars in there. Um, this is when we look uh, only at the visible range, which is only a tiny fraction of the full electromagnetic uh, range um, that you see that you see here. So as a function of uh, energy, basically, you see here this, this tiny little bit that we can see with our eyes, that our eyes uh, are sensitive to. But um, you could also go to lower energies and observe, for example, in radio waves, or you go to higher energies. Uh, and in the extreme case, you would observe in gamma rays. And every time we do that, we basically open a new window to the universe, because looking at those um, light and different um, energies, we can really trace different processes in the universe. And normally we can um, yeah, learn something new by doing that because those different energies would trace different physical processes in the universe. And really, if we combine all of them, we get a more complete picture of the universe. So here are now um, two other sky maps, uh, one in the radio and one in the, in the gamma ray. And if you compare, for example, the gamma ray map with the visible map, you see that that what is like appears dark in the visible map suddenly is bright in the gamma rays. And this is because our galaxy is filled with cosmic rays. Um, those are charged particles, the electrons and protons. And when they uh, hit the gas in the, in the Milky Way that is basically blocking the visible light, then um, they produce gamma ray in those interactions. And, and by this, we can basically trace the cosmic rays in our galaxy, and we can also trace the, um, the gas in our galaxy. So we learn something new compared to by just looking uh, at the visible light. And of course, to, if you want to do that, if you want to look in different frequencies, you have to use different uh, telescopes for this. Um, here's just an example of a large uh, radio antenna, uh, and if you want to observe gamma rays, you have to go uh, to space. And I believe we had a we had a talk by uh, Michele Negro uh, a few weeks ago, and she told you of everything um, about the uh, Fermi gamma ray space telescope. Um, but what I want to tell you about is uh, now something uh, completely different. So imagine like every time we use a different frequency, we learn something new about the universe. But what if we use something that is actually not light? And in my case, this would be a tiny particle uh, called neutrino. Uh, so let me take a step back and explain you what this uh, neutrino is. Um, 
So if we look at, if we try to figure out what the tiniest particles are that our, um, what that we are made of and also our universe uh, is made of, we can, we can start from looking at uh, a little drop of water that has roughly the size of one, uh, one millimeter. Um, then we, we know that the water is composed of many water molecules and those are uh, tiny, tiny. So uh, three times 10 to the minus seven millimeters or 0 0.000 whatever three millimeters. Um, so they're already tiny but they are not elementary particles yet. Um, if we look at the uh, hydrogen atom that is part of the, of the water molecule, then uh, we know that there's a nucleus that is in, in the case of hydrogen is made out of a proton and an electron that's basically um, in the simple model uh, circling the, the nucleus, the proton in this case. So we believe that the electron is elementary. That means you cannot divide it into smaller particles from what we know at the moment, but the proton actually is not. Um, so in big particle accelerators uh, at, at CERN, uh, close to uh, Geneva, for example, um, one figured out that the proton is not elementary and you could even look closer into the proton and the proton is made out of um, quarks and gluons, even tinier particles than the proton itself. And those again, we think are elementary particles. Uh, so those elementary particles um, make up the hydrogen atom, but they basically make up everything, uh, including us. And also the neutrino is one of those elementary particles. And uh, in fact, it's the most elusive elementary particle that we know of. Um, yeah, a few more facts about this elusive neutrino that's also referred to as the ghost particle. Um, I already told you it's a subatomic particle and we think it's an elementary particle. It has almost no mass. And if we try to compare it to the electron, for example, the electron is already tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and if uh, we imagine the neutrino mass would be a drop of water, then if we compare it to the electron, the electron would be a bathtub full of water. And in this picture, the proton would be a whole uh, swimming pool full of water. Um, so the mass of the neutrino is tiny. And again, compared to the electron, the neutrino has no charge. It's a neutral particle. Um, and it only interacts weakly. Um, and taking all this together means that the probability for a neutrino to hit something if it travels through matter is also tiny. Um, said in the words of uh, Douglas Adams, the chances of a neutrino actually hitting something as it travels through all this polling emptiness are roughly comparable to that of dropping a ball bearing at random from a cruising 747 and hitting, say, an egg sandwich. Um, so it's like, um, there is neutrino, I will tell you later, neutrinos are everywhere, but the chance that they actually do something while they're flying around is really tiny. So how, where are they produced? How do we even know that they, uh, that they exist? They were first predicted, um, they were predicted by a theorist in the 1920s because it, like, uh, people started to look at nuclear decay processes and um, by looking at the decay products, they figured out that it looked like there was energy missing in the nuclear decay. And the con uh, conservation of energy is basically the holy grail, holy grail, grail in physics. So there was a huge crisis and people thought maybe in nuclear decay, energy conservation is, uh, is, uh, is actually not there. Um, but then um, in the 20s, uh, Pauli uh, suggested that there was actually another particle taking part in the decay and this particle would just disappear. We couldn't see it, but it would take some of the energy. And by doing this, he, he basically uh, uh, saved the law of energy conservation. Um, but it took, uh, I think 20 more years before this neutrino particles were actually detected. Um, and this happened close to a nuclear power plant because in the uh, nuclear um, reactions in the nuclear power plant, you produce a lot of neutrinos. And then you can place your, your detector close by and, and detect uh, those neutrinos produced um, in, in the processes in the nuclear power plant. Um, 
but yeah, we're talking about astronomy here. And Jews are also produced in the center of the sun. Uh, in the fusion inside the sun, we produce a lot, a lot of neutrinos. Um, actually, so many neutrinos that through the area of your thumbnail, you have uh, roughly 80 billion neutrinos passing through every second. Now you can calculate how many will pass through your whole body in your lifetime. But most of those neutrinos, they just pass through, they don't do anything. And you maybe have a handful of neutrino interactions in your body in your entire lifetime. All the other ones, they just pass through, they don't do anything. Um, in addition to neutrinos from the sun, uh, we found only one single time neutrinos from an object outside of um, our own galaxy in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And that was in 1987, a supernova exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy to, um, to our Milky Way. And that was the first and only time that um, there was a significant detection of neutrinos um, from, um, from a supernova explosion. And what, what I'm interested in are uh, high energy neutrinos, um, which are produced in the most violent processes in distant galaxies. Um, so now for comparison, the neutrinos that are produced in nuclear power plants in the sun and they were produced in, in the supernova in 1987 are at low energies. Um, and well, I'm a particle physicist, so I measure energies in electron volts. Those were MeV, uh, mega electron volts. It doesn't matter if you don't understand what an electron volt is, it's just uh, the comparison is important. So the high energy neutrinos that I'm interested in that are probably produced in distant galaxies have uh, peta electron volt energies. So a billion times more energy than the neutrinos that were detected in the sun and, and from the one supernova. Uh, so much higher energies. Um, and uh, why, why do I care about those high energy neutrinos? They are interesting because they trace the most energetic processes in the universe. Um, and those are connected to high energy cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are not, not neutrinos, those are charged particles, mainly protons, and they hit our atmosphere from all directions all the time. And we do measure them and they have, we figure out that they have incredible high energies. Um, so we can now compare the energies that we find in cosmic rays, which are mainly protons, to the highest particle energies that we can produce on Earth. So the best particle accelerator that we have on Earth is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, close to Geneva. And here's an um, illustration. So this is, uh, this is Lake Geneva here in the back. Um, and you see this uh, yellow ring that's actually uh, under the Earth, so you wouldn't really see it. And it has a radius of uh, more than four kilometers. And what is done there is that the protons are accelerated um, and then smashed into each other um, at uh, extremely high energy. So they're accelerated to almost the speed of light and then smashed into each other to um, study new particles that are produced in, in, this, uh, uh, in this process. So those are the highest particle energies that we can produce on Earth. It's a pretty impressive machine. Now we could um, imagine if we want to produce the same energies on Earth that we see in those cosmic particles that hit us all the time, we, uh, we would have to build a larger ring to accelerate the particles. If we assume we have the same technology and the size is um, determined by the magnets that are used to keep the particles in, in the ring. Um, so we would need to um, increase the radius of our large hadron collider to build whatever a super large uh, hadron collider uh, and to reach the highest particles that we see in cosmic rays we would have to increase the radius to one astronomical unit um, so hopefully that tells us that those particles we we um, measure in the cosmic rays are have incredible high energies um, and now the question is where do they come from right it tells us that nature our universe has accelerators that are extremely powerful. Um, and we want to know what those accelerators are. The problem about those cosmic rays, uh, I told you, is mainly protons. So those are charged particles. So when they produce somewhere in the universe in a distant source, uh, on their way to us, they have to pass magnetic fields. 
So our Earth has a magnetic field, our galaxy has a magnetic field, and distant galaxies would have magnetic fields. And probably even between galaxies, there might be magnetic fields. So that means the protons are deflected in those magnetic fields. And once they reach us on Earth, they do not point back to their origin anymore. And this is where the neutrino enters the game because the neutrinos are produced in interactions of those cosmic ray protons with uh, ambient matter or photon fields in the source. Um, and the hydrogen neutrinos are only produced in those processes. It's the only process that we can think of that will produce high-energy neutrinos. Um, so if we could measure those high-energy neutrinos, then we could measure their direction because those are now neutral particles, so they would not be deflected by magnetic fields. If we can measure their direction, they would point us back to the source of those high-energy cosmic rays. And then the, the third ingredient now to solve the puzzle of the origin of high-energy cosmic rays is that once we know the direction, we have to figure out what is in that direction, right? We now know the direction, but we want to know like, what kind of source is in that direction. And for this, we need photons. For example, optical, an optical telescope, we would look in that direction and then hopefully see what kind of source is in that direction that could potentially produce the kind of um, Okay, this is what, what I'm after in, in my research. Um, and now you probably want to know how do we manage to catch those uh, uh, neutrinos that are such elusive particles. Um, we do that by measuring them indirectly. So imagine we had a, a, yeah, a glass of water, for example, and then the neutrino comes in. Most of them would just fly through, but there is a tiny probability that eventually one of them would interact. So it would hit a nucleus. Um, so you have a nu nuclear interaction when the neutrino hits the nucleus. And in this interaction, you produce other particles. Um, for example, electrons or muons. Muon is just the heavy brother of an electron. It's also a charged particle, just heavier. Um, if the neutrino has a lot of energy, it also gives a lot of energy to uh, those secondary particles, the electron or the muon. Um, and because they have so much energy, they travel really fast through the water. Um, and if they travel faster than the speed of light in the water, that sounds crazy because you probably learned in high school and nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And that is true for the vacuum speed of light. But in a medium, the speed of light is reduced. So this electron can now travel slower than the vacuum speed of light, but faster than the speed of light in the, the medium. And if that happens, then this particle will emit, will emit so-called Cherenkov radiation. That's a bluish light that is emitted. And, and maybe some of you have seen a documentary about the nuclear power plant. If you can, if you see um, inside the, the um, cooling water of the nuclear power plant, you see this bluish, uh, bluish light in there. And that's actually also Cherenkov radiation. Uh, and I heard something which sounds crazy, and, and I have never experienced that if you travel on long distance flights and you close your eyes, you sometimes see like little flashes of, of light in your, in, your, in your eyes that are closed. And that would actually also be during our radiation from uh, cosmic rays that like, you would not, um, yeah, if, if, if you're at high altitude, uh, they, you're not protected by the atmosphere and you have a, you're exposed to more cosmic radiation and then it could happen that they hit your eyebrow. So I, that never happened to me. I did a lot of long distance flights. Um, but I actually, um, um, I know a pilot um, and, and she told me that actually sometimes happened to her. So maybe, maybe it's really a thing and maybe, maybe all of you have already experienced drink or radiation um, in your eyeball. Uh, but this effect, we use this effect to uh, measure high energy neutrinos through this, the secondary particles and which emit drink of radiation. But as I told you, it's very rare that the neutrino interacts. So if we only had a glass of water, we probably have to wait uh, um, hundreds of years before a neutrino would interact in that, in that glass of water. So we need something that's much bigger than a glass of water. And uh, yeah, by the way, the same thing also works in ice. Um, but what we need is a, is a transparent detector that is really huge, has a huge volume. So we could try to build like a big tank that we equip somehow with light sensors um, 
but it's actually not feasible for the high energy neutrinos that are really rare. You need something like a cubic kilometer detector to see a few events per year, a few interesting events per year. So you can't really build a tank of that size. So what we have to do is find a natural medium that gives us a cubic kilometer of transparent ice or water. And we find this at the South Pole. Um, so we have to go to the South Pole to build a detector to find high energy neutrinos. Um, this is a picture of the South Pole. Um, you see here the, um, the Skyway. And this is the Scott Amundsen South Pole Station. Um, and you actually also see the biggest neutrino detector in the world. Um, this building is part of it, but you don't actually see the detector because it's in the ice. Um, but before I tell you details, I will first take you on a little trip to the South Pole that I had to do as a PhD student um, many years ago, already old. Um, at that point, I, I lived in Berlin, in Germany, and I had to take a, a flight to Bangkok. From Bangkok, I flew to Sydney, from Sydney to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, finally, I was equipped with those uh, amazing red jackets and, and um, other equipment that would um, help me to survive in the cold at the South Pole. And then I continued from, uh, from New Zealand. I took a flight to the coast of uh, Antarctica. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I exchanged the beautiful beaches of New Zealand with, uh, with the McMurdo Station in Antarctica, which is not a very beautiful place. Nothing grows there. It's, uh, yeah, it's just uh, dirt and, and ice. And there's a, a large population in summer, like a thousand people that live there. But I just spent one night there. And then I continued uh, the last stretch from McMurdo to the South Pole, which is pretty much in the center of the Antarctic continent. Um, so already this flight from New Zealand to McMurdo was done by a, a US military flight. Uh, and you see here a picture of the plane that finally brought me from McMurdo to the South Pole. So because of the South Pole, there is no real airport. Um, the plane needs to have seas, uh, not wheels to land on. And it's also not very um, comfortable inside. So there are no comfortable seats. Um, there's only those, uh, yeah, those nets you see here where you, yeah, so it's not, it's not very common. It's also really, really noisy. Um, but it was still beautiful because you have those beautiful views. What you see here is that there's a mountain range here. So we cross this mountain range and there's one, one picture here. See amazing glaciers um, and, and it was really worth it. Um, and yeah, finally uh, I arrived at the, at the South Pole at the uh, Scott Amundsen station and uh, in this picture I only took off my head for the picture because it, it was really cold. Um, to get an idea of the temperature I, I checked uh, it was last week what is the temperature at the at the South Pole and um, yeah you see you see it really uh, pretty chilly. Um, yeah but coming back to the neutrinos uh, I already told you you see this building here and um, the largest neutrino detector in the world is the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, and you do not see it because it's inside the ice. So let me show you a sketch of what it looks like. Here again is the, the building on top. It is a cubic kilometer of ice instrumented with optical sensors. So very um, sensitive light sensors that can see in little flashes of light. Uh, so we drill two and a half kilometer deep holes and put in um, so-called strings, big cables, and on the bottom kilometer of the two and a half kilometer deep cable, we attach um, the optical modules. And in total, we have a grid of optical modules in the ice, um, um, more than 5,000 of those modules. And an optical module is, has basically the size of a basketball. It's a big glass sphere to withstand the, the high pressure, uh, two and a half kilometers deep in the ice. Um, and inside is a, is a photomultiplier. That's an instrument that, that detects, um, can detect a single photon. Okay? And um, a bunch of electronics. So what we do is we, um, <clears throat> yeah, we measure the, the, the signal and then we digitize the signal inside this uh, glass sphere. So basically there is a main board inside the, the glass sphere and then we send the digital um, information on the cable up to the 
building on the surface that combines then um, all the signals from the um, from the 86 strings uh, in the in the ice with more than 5,000 optical modules attached to them. Um, so yeah, I, I told you it's a cubic kilometer of ice instrumented, and that corresponds to 400,000 Olympic pools. So it's a huge volume. And we need this huge volume to, to be able to catch only a few of those high energy neutrinos. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's some, some pictures. Um, how do we get the instruments inside the ice? <coughs> we have to drill holes two and a half kilometers deep. That needs a lot of energy. And we do it with hot water drills. So we basically melt the holes. Um, and yeah, you see one picture um, where you look inside the hole. And on the other side, you see uh, scientists attaching one of those optical sensors to one of the strings. <coughs> mm -hmm. So the total power consumption for the drill is five megawatts. I had to look up um, what to compare that to. It, it more or less corresponds to the power consumption of flying a Boeing 737. <coughs> um, and the process is pretty slow. We, uh, we drill about one meter in, in two minutes. So it takes roughly 48 hours to drill the hole, get out the cable, uh, get, get out the drill and put in the um, the, the instruments. So it took several years to build uh, the detector because you can only, so in the summer, in, in, in the South Pole, you have a few months of summer where it's bright all the time. And then in winter, it's dark all the time and you can't, you can't work there, right? <coughs> so therefore, there's only three months where you can really do work at the South Pole. So it took a few years to complete the detector. Um, but it was completed. Um, 10 years ago, this year we celebrate the 10 year anniversary, anniversary of, the, of the ice cube detector. Obviously, this is a huge project that cannot be done by a single scientist or by a single university, but it's done by the ice cube collaboration um, that consists of, I think, 12 countries involved. And you see that we spread all over the world. There's a large, um, there are large groups in the US, in uh, Canada, there are several groups in, in Europe. Um, we have some colleagues in Australia and in Japan and in South Korea. So we have quite a big, diverse team. We roughly 300 scientists and we meet twice per year in person if there wouldn't be COVID. <laughs> the last, uh, last year we only met on Zoom, unfortunately. But this is um, how it looks when we meet in person. <coughs> and in those meetings, we yeah, we um, <coughs> talk about the data analysis and how to calibrate the detector. And we already have ideas how to build a new detector in the future. Um, and this is how it looks when now a neutrino is detected by the detector. So now the neutrino interacted. So now what you see is actually the muon traveling through the detector in the tincture rank of light. And then in different colors, you see the light arriving at this grid of optical modules that we have in the eyes. And the different colors indicate different arrival time of the light on the sensor. So we have nanosecond precision for the um, time measurement. And the different size of the blobs that you see in this um, little video tell us how much light was um, detected at this individual module. <coughs> so already by eye, you get an idea of the direction of the neutrino flying through the detector. And of course, now we have a sophisticated algorithms that would uh, reconstruct the direction and tell us where the neutrino came from. Uh, so yeah, now you're probably curious what, what are our results from the ice cube detector. And we managed to detect uh, high energy neutrinos um, from outside of our own galaxy for the first time in 2013. And started with three very high energy neutrinos that you, you see displayed here. So you see they are high energy because they have much more light than the one that I, I showed you before in the movie. So the amount of light basically is the measure for the energy. Um, so they're so bright that we um, that it was pretty clear that they cannot be um, 
produced um, um, in the atmosphere, because that's the background uh, that we have in our detector. Um, and yeah, we were really uh, excited about those first events and we, we even gave them names. They were um, Ernie Bird and Big Bird, the three first ones at high energy. <clears throat> but then a bit later, we actually found uh, the whole Muppet Show at the, at the South Pole. And that was really the first detection of uh, high energy extragalactic neutrinos. Um, but what we found is a so-called diffuse flux. So not all, the neutrinos didn't come all from the same direction, but they came from everywhere in the sky, um, which is exciting. And, and here's a picture of uh, where the neutrinos come from. So now it's a, it's a bunch of them that we, that we have detected. And what we initially were hoping for that most of them would come from the same direction, then it would tell us, okay, there is a source in this direction that's producing the high energy neutrinos, but now they come from everywhere. Um, and that tells us that probably we are dealing with a lot of dim neutrino sources distributed in, in the sky. And from this image, we can also see that um, we're dealing with extragalactic sources. Um, this, um, the coordinate system chosen here is equatorial coordinates. So this line here would be the galactic plane. If the neutrinos came from our galaxy, they would be clustered along the galactic plane, but that's you can already see by eye that is not the case, but you can also run sophisticated algorithms that tell you it's really not the case. Most of them have to be of extragalactic origin. So to figure out uh, where they're coming from, um, IceCube has set up a so-called target of opportunity program. And the idea here is <clears throat> that high energy neutrinos are detected by IceCube at the South Pole in real time. And once we find a high energy neutrino, right, we can, we can um, measure the direction and then broadcast this information to a network of uh, telescopes around the world. And the idea is that then the telescope would immediately slew in the direction that I speak tells them to look at, and then hopefully find an electromagnetic counterpart of the high energy neutrino. So you could do this with optical telescopes, radio telescopes, gamma ray telescopes. So if you remember, um, Michaela's talk about Fermi. Fermi is participating in this program to follow up high energy neutrino events by Ice Cube. Um, and I would like to tell you about an optical follow up program that um, uh, my group um, is, is leading in, in Bochum and, and at DC. Um, and we do this with the Zwicky Transient Trans Facility, ZTF. Um, that's a 1.2 meter telescope on Mount Paloma in California. <clears throat> you see here in the yeah, picture of the dome. And what is special about this telescope that it has a huge field of view. So the, the biggest field of view uh, of any telescopes um, larger than, than one meter. Um, and here you see compared to, uh, to other telescopes. So the moon is actually to scale for the field of view of those different uh, of those different telescopes, and this one is ETF. So it has a um, forty-seven square degree field of view. If that doesn't tell you anything, the full sky is um, forty thousand square degrees, and and this field of view um, covers roughly two hundred fifty times the full moon. So it's really impressive um, field of view, and. <clears throat> Um, here some more details about the about the telescope. Um, so it's a, a Schmidt telescope design. So the camera is actually placed inside the telescope tube. Um, it has a giant shutter in front of the telescope. So you see it in the drawing here. And this is a picture of um, um, some scientists and engineers that, that built a shutter. So it's a, it's a huge shutter. And, and here's a, a detailed view of the, of the camera. So the, the camera comes in, in segments, um, 16 CCDs and each CCT, CCD is uh, 6,000 times 6,000 pixels. Um, so it's quite an impressive camera on, and to get a, an idea of the, of the size. Um, so this is the filter that comes in front of the camera but the camera is the same size as what you, what you see there. Um, so it's yeah, it's quite an impressive uh, camera um, that you need to to get this huge field of view um, <clears throat> in in the telescope. 
Um, so what can we achieve with, uh, with DTF because of the huge field of view? Um, we can actually um, scan the entire sky, the entire northern sky, visible northern sky uh, every night up to a magnitude of uh, 20 and a half. And, and this is a little movie that you see here. So each um, square that shows up in the movie is one pointing of the telescope. Um, each exposure takes 30 seconds and there is a less than 50 second overhead um, before we can go to the, to the next expo exposure. Um, and, and this video covers uh, three or four hours only. And you see how much of the sky we can, we can, we can cover in only a few hours. You also see that the colors are changing. This is when a different filter was placed in front of the telescope. So we have an RG and an I band filter. Um, so, we, and then we go back to the fields, to the same fields, and that allows us to uh, see variable and transient objects. This is the goal of, of ZTF. Um, in total, we have more than 250 observations per field a year. And now an integrated version of, of the little movie that I, that I showed you is, is this one. This, the, the color scale is the number of, of observations that ZTF has done. And there are some fields we cover more than a thousand times. And you see we have a pretty good coverage of the, of the northern sky with ZTF. So it's really a transient factory because every like we go there um, many times to the same field that means we can detect everything that's very well attended. How is this now connected to our neutrinos? Um, so again, the idea is we measure the high energy neutrinos with the ice cube. The ice cube tells us where they come from. Then we point uh, ZTF in that direction. Uh, and, and here I should say that the direction resolution, the angular resolution of ice cube is not great. So usually um, the area in the sky that we know where the neutrino came from is a few square degrees. So I guess for an, an optical astronomer, that's a, it's a nightmare. Um, um, but luckily, ZTF has a, has a large uh, field of view, so we only have to point once. We cover the full um, neutrino footprint. And because we have guaranteed observed this field already many times, we, we have the history of everything that can happen in this field. And, and that turns out to be important. Um, so what we're looking for is, um, um, yeah, potential neutrino sources that are, yeah, could be some explosions in the sky or some uh, um, <clears throat> highly energetic objects. Um, and, and now with ZTF, we find uh, more than 10,000 objects every night. Most of them are not interesting to us. Most of them are variable stars, uh, asteroids. Um, I mean, other people are interested in those and do science for those, but we care about those most energetic processes that could potentially produce high energy. So we have some um, dedicated software package that would reject stars, variable stars, planets, artifacts, asteroids. So we only keep potentially interesting neutrino candidates. Um, those would usually be a handful if we do the follow-up with ZTF. So we already reduced the number of objects by a lot. And then we want to get more information on those objects um, to really figure out if those could be neutrino sources. Um, and we do this by getting a more follow-up observation with different telescopes. But they could be in different wavelengths or we um, probably want to get a, a spectrum. So we would trigger observations for the spectrograph because in, in ZTF, we only have photometry, right? And we have three filters. Usually we observe in two filters, um, but that doesn't really, it's not really enough to tell us like what is this object we are, we are looking at. Um, yeah, so we trigger more observations for maybe a handful of objects to figure out what actually we are dealing with. Um, and this is how it looks like. So that's the uh, ZTF telescope. So you see that the mount is like is a pretty old instrument, but the, the camera is brand new um, and the optics have been improved as well. Um, and now here's a little movie. So you see that we slew um, the instrument um, quickly to the neutrino direction. Um, 
then we run our software to identify potentially interesting candidates among the in this huge field of view. And now we get a zoom in on one candidate that we decided was uh, interesting. It's called AT 2019 DSG. And this is the most interesting we have found, most interesting thing we have found so far. So let me tell you a bit more about this object. Um, so we found this object in coincidence with the Heinegger neutrino measured by Ice Cube. Um, and this is how we call our Heinegger neutrinos that just tells us it, it was detected in uh, 2019, uh, 1st of October. And it had uh, 200 TeV uh, energy, so it's a pretty high energy event also in, in terms of ice cube uh, energies that, that we measure. And, and what you see in this plot is uh, the light curve. So you see uh, as a function of um, time in days, um, you see the um, flux measured in, in the optical field. Um, and this is when the neutrino arrived. So when the neutrino arrived, we started to take data with, uh, with ZTF, but we have the huge advantage that ZTF already took data of this object in the past. So we can go back and, and look, at the, look at the light curve. Um, so um, yeah, the red and the green is what uh, ZTF detected. And we see that already other people were excited about this and they triggered more observations here in the UV with the SWIFT satellite. And after the neutrino arrived, there was more UV detection because we triggered SWIFT again because we wanted to know what, what is this object doing now. Um, and uh, what else I want to tell you about the So it, uh, the work was done by um, my student, Robert. He, he found this object, he was uh, pretty excited. And um, this object is a tidal disruption event. I will tell you more later about what that actually is. Um, in ZTF, we, uh, we have a hard time to remember the names of those objects, right? AT 2019 DSG is hard, hard to remember. So all objects of this type get a new name by, um, by our ZTF colleagues um, according to Game of Thrones characters. Uh, and this one was um, named Bren Stark. So this is Bren. Don't confuse Bren with Robert. They look maybe slightly similar. Um, well, yeah, there is a class of objects, and we think this is a so-called uh, tidal disruption event. So let me explain you what a tidal disruption event. We have a black hole, and um, a quiet black hole, a supermassive black hole in the center of some distant galaxy, and now a star comes too close to this black hole. So what happens is that the star um, will get pulled apart by by gravity because the mm, so the the, the the gravity um, uh, will depend on the radius. So the, the close part of the star will experience a lot more gravity than the far away part of the star. So it will get somehow elongated. And eventually those uh, tidal forces are larger than the gravitational force holding the star together. And if that happens, then the star will be pulled apart, tidally disrupted. And then what you also, maybe say it again. So now the star, is getting too close. You zoom in from the star, you see that it's starting to be pulled apart and eventually is shredded by the um, gravitational force. And then some of the debris of the star will be accreted onto the black hole and some of it will be just expelled. And then in some rare cases, you can also produce a relativistic jet um, shooting material with almost the speed of light um, out of the accretion region. So we believe this object that we found was uh, one of those tidal disruption um, events. Uh, here you see this again in, in images. So you have a supermassive black hole and the star. The star comes too close, gets uh, pulled apart, and some of the material is accreted onto the black hole. And in some cases, not in all of the cases, there are uh, relativistic particle jets produced. Um, so tidal disruption events, they have been uh, predicted already a long time ago, but um, only now with, um, with those large modern optical surveys, we actually find more of them and we do get a better understanding of what they actually are. 
<clears throat> so currently we maybe have 50 to 100 um, identified title disruption events. Um, I say 50 to 100 because often it is, is difficult to really identify what they are because it's, it's a, a little bit difficult to distinguish them from regular active galaxies that would like accrete is an active galaxy is also a supermassive black hole accreting material and, and they usually also have jets um, but they do accrete all the time and in this case you have a quiet supermassive black hole that's not doing anything and now you have this uh, sudden event where the star is too close to the, um, to the supermassive black hole um, and three of those um, known tidal disruption events are jetted events where we, we really have a confirmation that there is um, a highly relativistic jet produced. Um, yeah, so why do we know that this event that we found is, is a tidal disruption event? One characteristic thing for tidal disruption events is the slope um, of the light curve. Um, and it follows this characteristic slope that is predicted by general relativity where you can calculate what happens when, when you throw material onto a black hole. Um, and we also, um, we got additional information. We, don't, we have the um, optical UV information and we also have uh, X-ray measured by the SWIFT satellite. And you see the, the X-ray down here. <clears throat> and uh, what was the most important thing, we also have uh, several optical spectra um, shown here on the, on the right. And the emission lines in the spectrum um, then tell us that this really was a tidal disruption event. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and because it's, it's far away, it's a dim source, we, uh, we needed to get the spectrum of large telescopes, um, for example, with, uh, with PEC on Hawaii. Um, and yeah, because we got many spectra, we can even study the spectral evolution, which is important to um, learn about the properties um, of this event. We can try to infer the mass of the black hole, for example, and what kind of stuff and inside. Um, but why, why do we think this is interesting and why do we think this is related to the high energy neutrino that we found? So in fact, those tidal disruption events were already in 2009, they were predicted as potential high energy cosmic ray sources. Uh, and after Ice Cube had detected this diffuse flux of neutrinos, where we didn't know where they come from at that point, um, there were also um, several theoretical works um, predicting that tidal disruption events would produce all or at least some of this uh, of the neutrinos that ice cube had detected. So this was already on our radar. It was something we were looking for with our program. Um, so we were really excited when we found this event. And what really convinced us that this was quite interesting was that uh, we already also um, took radio data with uh, three different instruments, with the VLA in Mexico, Amy in, in the UK, and Mercat in South Africa. And uh, the, um, what, what we learned from the radio data, so here again, in, um, as a function of um, time, we, um, we inferred the energy in the, uh, in the radio emission. Um, and we find that it's increasing over time which tells us that there has to be some inner engine at work inside of the source um, that's powering the radio emission. And radio, every time you see radio emission, it, it tells you basically that there have to be high energy particles in the source that, that do emit this, uh, this radio emission. Um, so we were excited that it was, first of all, it was detected in radio and um, um, that the, it, it seemed that the energy um, injected in radio was even increasing over time. As you saw that the neutrino actually arrived um, quite some time after the optical peak of the source, uh, uh, almost 150 days after the optical peak. Um, but, but actually it all made sense when we looked at the radio data that told us that the, the source was still active even um, more than 100 days after, after the optical peak. So this really made us believe that the neutrino could be 
uh, connected to the source and that the source is actually capable um, to produce high energy neutrinos. The other question we have to ask ourselves is, uh, could this just be a chance coincidence, right? Um, if you look somewhere in the sky, and, and then the neutrino footprint is quite large, right? A few square degrees. Then what is the chance that you find re randomly you find a tidal disruption event in, in that direction? Um, but first thing, as I told you, tidal disruption events are quite rare. So we only know 50 to 100 by, by now. Um, and this was a very bright tidal disruption event. Uh, so we calculated the uh, chance coincident probability, and it's only 0.2% um, to find a tidal disruption event that is that bright. So the, the probability that was just a random alignment is actually very small. So what we found is, um, yeah, it looks like a quite significant um, correlation of the neutrino to the tidal disruption event. And now, if we believe that this is a true association, it was not a random alignment, then it tells us that um, this extra galactic source has to produce um, high energy particles, at least at, um, uh, at PEV energies. Um, yeah, so this is still um, a few hundred times more than what we produce at the Large Hadron Collider. And, and this will really be the first time that we can pinpoint an extra galactic source um, as an accelerator of particles to those high energies. Um, so this, yeah, this is quite exciting. And this was a true multi-messenger event, right? So to, to figure out that this source was producing high energy protons, we needed the neutrinos, we needed the optical follow-up, um, we needed the optical spectrum, we needed the radio data. So we really have to put all this together um, to draw this conclusion that uh, this tidal disruption event um, most likely produced um, protons at peta electron energies. Um, and yeah, the community also thought this was interesting. We published it in Nature Astronomy and it even made it to the, to the title page. Um, so what is next? We, we found this, but it's a single event. Um, to really prove that neutrinos are coming from tidal disruption events, we, we need more than this. Um, so we need to find more candidates with the ice cream and GTF. Um, and I give you a small teaser. We actually identified a second event. So I, I showed you Brent Stark, and now we found Tywin. Um, so I, I, you already saw this, the light curve of, uh, of Brent Stark and the high energy neutrino that came uh, roughly 150 days after the optical peak. Now Tywin looks a bit uh, different. Um, so it's uh, intrinsically much, much, much brighter than, um, uh, than Brent Stark. This is now the, the luminosity, so the intrinsic brightness of the source. Um, and the neutrino came roughly a year after the optical peak. Um, but also here, the energetics are, are favorable. And um, well, we haven't published this yet. We're still, we're still working on it. But we're quite excited that we potentially found the, the second candidate um, confirming our hypothesis that TDEs are neutrino emitters. Um, but yeah, in the future, we will, we will be able to learn much more about this possible connection with, uh, with new instruments. Um, for example, in, um, in the field of neutrino astronomy, uh, there are three new instruments um, planned or under construction. Um, I didn't mention that there is also a neutrino detector currently in the Mediterranean Sea. It is much smaller than Ice Cube. It's called, it's called Antares, uh, in the, um, close to the French coast. And in the same location, they're building now a larger instrument. They would also be a cubic kilometers so of similar size um, than Ice Cube. And there is some advantages in water. For example, you have less scattering on the ice uh, than in the ice um, of the of the Cherenko photons that allows you to reconstruct the direction with higher accuracy. So you wouldn't have maybe uh, one square degree, but the um, arrow circle in the sky would be a bit smaller, which uh, of course makes astronomy then much easier. And the second such detector is, uh, in, is under construction in uh, Lake Baikal in uh, Siberia. And also at the South Pole, we're planning an upgrade to the ice cube detector and what we call ice cube gen two. 
for the next generation, but also Gen 2 is a type of penguin. It's not, uh, not just a lame, um, a lame versioning name. Um, and what we plan at the South Pole would be a 10 times bigger detector. So the, the volume would be um, yeah, roughly 10 times bigger. Um, the first stage of, of building this is, is already approved and we're now working on um, uh, convincing the National Science Foundation to give us money to build, uh, to, to build this 10 times uh, bigger instrument at the South Pole. Uh, that will be one important ingredient, but at the same time, there's also a new follow-up instrument under construction. Um, um, uh, the most interesting one for this type of research would be the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory. And I, I saw on your webpage that you also had someone uh, lined up to, to talk about um, the Vera Rubin Observatory and the uh, LSST survey that they, that they will perform in the future. And of course, this will also be super interesting to follow up interesting neutrino events. Um, and of course, there's other instruments uh, under construction or planned at um, different wavelengths that could potentially be also interesting to study the sources of, of high energy neutrino, neutrinos. So um, yeah, in summary, I think we're really at the beginning of um, doing astronomy with, uh, with high energy neutrinos, but uh, the future is bright, and there are, there are many exciting opportunities um, uh, ahead of us. So, so stay tuned um, of what we will detect in the future with IceCube and, uh, and its follow-up instruments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. von Kobiak. That was really, really yeah. fascinating. Um, I have a ton of questions for you, but um, I want to let um, everybody else who is here to ask their questions first. Um, we already got one in the chat, and it was a question about um, how we know the difference between um, a petavolt neutrino and a, um, a megavolt neutrino. And, and I suggested that it had something to do with the amount of radiation released, but I, I said we would ask you and, and find out. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So it is true. It is connected to the amount of light that would be produced in in the in the ice by by such a particle. The problem with ice cube is really optimized to measure those high energy neutrinos, um, and and that means in that case, um, if you want to measure low energy neutrinos, you have to put your optical sensors very close together because there will not be a lot of light produced and if you put your sensors too far away and the event happens between the sensors you would not be able to to see the light anymore so in ice cube the the strings um, the cables we have in the ice they are um, more than 100 meters apart from, from each other and then on each cable you have lined up the optical sensors and they are 70 meters apart from each other uh, which is too far away to detect mev um, neutrinos so really our energy threshold is somewhere at uh, 100 giga electron volts. Um, while if you want to see neutrinos from the sun, the low energy neutrinos, um, you need a detector like the Super Kamiokande detector in Japan. That is um, a huge water tank in a mine. And um, yeah, everywhere in the, on the outside of the tank, uh, you have optical sensors. So there's one next to each other. Maybe I have a backup slide actually. Let me see. No, I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I promised too much. Yeah, so they really have one, one, uh, one optical module next to each other. That's why they can measure smaller energies. Um, but of course the price they pay is that they, they cannot build a heat detector. It would not be, it would not be feasible. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, if, if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to ask. Just remember to unmute yourself. Yeah, this is um, um, Mike Adler. Uh, I was curious, what other physics um, uh, that this type of uh, neutron detector can help us with, uh, such as understanding uh, 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 some of the uh, Issues that are uh, coming out in terms of um, uh, cosmology and uh, the uh, Big Bang physics. Uh, what now we're seeing a discrepancy in the uh, measurement of um, 
of the Hubble parameter. And I'm just curious if uh, there's uh, uh, things that we can learn from studying neutrinos uh, that help uh, sort some of the help. Um, so with the neutrino detectors, we can learn a lot about particle physics. So neutrinos are also really uh, interesting particles. Um, so they, I, I care about them to do astronomy, but in them, in, in themselves, they're actually really, uh, really interesting. And they're studied in, well, not only with ice cube, but also with accelerator experiments. Um, um, because they have a lot of interesting features that were not really predicted. For example, they um, they come in three different, um, we call them flavors. So there's electron neutrinos, near neutrinos, and tau neutrinos, and they oscillate. So they change flavors on their way. And that's something that, um, yeah, what, um, that, that was not predicted. And by measuring neutrinos for the first time from the sun, the sun is producing only electron neutrinos. Um, and, and the first measurements of those neutrinos found only roughly a third of what was predicted. Um, so first people thought hmm, maybe there's something wrong with our models of fusion in, in the sun. Um, but then later it turned out that actually the electron neutrinos on their way from the sun to us convert to a different flavor that the detectors were not sensitive to. Um, and that's something, uh, something super interesting. <coughs> Um, so there are also predictions for so-called sterile neutrinos. Those would be neutrinos that we cannot directly detect, um, but in, they would um, also participate in this oscillation. And the, the sterile neutrinos are candidates for uh, dark matter. So we don't know what dark matter is. We see it um, from the gravitational pull. Um, and, and one idea is that sterile neutrinos could be um, particles that made this dark matter. And uh, people are searching for those sterile neutrinos. Also with ice cube, we um, we look at the oscillation pattern, um, and by having the three neutrinos, you have a kind of a prediction for the oscillation pattern. But if you would find something that's different from that prediction, that could mean that there is a fourth neutrino, a sterile neutrino, um, that that could then um, be responsible for um, for dark matter. There are other other models for dark matter particles that uh, if they would decay or annihilate uh, as decay products would produce neutrinos. So we're looking for that as well with ice cube. <coughs> for example, there's ideas that the, those, uh, they, those would be like very heavy particles and they would um, accumulate in the, uh, in the sun, for example. So we're looking for high energy neutrinos from the sun. In the fusion, you, you produce those MeV neutrinos, but you would not expect any high MeV neutrinos. But if there would be those dark matter particles and they would decay in the sun, then we could also see high MeV neutrinos. So that's also something we are looking for. Um, in terms of cosmology, um, yeah, on, but yeah, we would maybe learn something about. Um, about dark matter, but uh, dark energy, I'm, uh, I'm not so sure what we could do with anything else at this point. Thank you very much. Got another question in the chat about um, whether or not the, the ice cube detectors are retrievable so they can be uh, upgraded. Um, and if ice cube two will be able to detect the different flavors of neutrinos. Um, so we, we cannot pull out the strings from the ice uh, again, because what we, we, we melt basically holes into the ice, we, we put the sensors in and, and the holes are filled with ice. So they would, it would take a few days and then they are frozen again. So it's, it's more or less impossible. <laughs> well, I guess we could try to remelt it, but it would just cost a lot of energy. Um, so we, we, we're not taking them out. What we're planning is just to build more sensors to, to build a bigger um, build a bigger detector. Um, I should also say that like, our detectors usually don't break. Um, they are um, those modules that we put in, in the ice, they, they are tested very well. And once we deploy them, there's a tiny fraction that break immediately. But all the other ones, they continue to run for already 10 years and they, they do not break. So we have a tiny failure rate, which is great. It allows us to 
to run this uh, many times. And the second question was um, for the different flavors. Uh, we are actually able to measure the different flavors with, uh, with ice cube. Um, so the, the ones that I showed you, because they are interesting to do astronomy, are uh, actually muon neutrino events. So if uh, the muon neutrino interacts, you produce a muon, and this muon makes a lot nice long track through the ice. Um, and that allows us to measure the direction. If you have an electron neutrino uh, and it would interact, you produce an electron. And this electron doesn't make it very far in the ice because you would start interacting with the uh, other electrons and nucleons in the ice. So it would maybe come and make it a few meters and produce new particles. All those particles to also produce Cherenkov light, but because the part like the particles don't get very far. You do not see this nice track through the ice um, because this particle shower that is produced has an extension of only a few meters. The few meters is small compared to more than 100 meters between this, the uh, strings. So what you see in that case is more a spherical rank of light signature. Um, and the spherical rank of light signature doesn't allow us to reconstruct the direction. So for astronomy, it's not interesting, but it is interesting for other things, uh, for the, the things I explained um, to uh, measure the oscillation properties, for example, uh, and also to measure the energy. Um, you can measure the energy more accurately with the spherical triangular light signature because all the light is contained in the detector. If you have a muon that eventually leaves the detector, you don't see all the light and, and you can only set a lower bound on the energy. So it's more difficult to get handled on, on, on the energy. Um, and then there's a third flavor, the so-called tau neutrino. And we, uh, we have uh, two candidates for a tau neutrino event. And, and that looks different because you have the interaction and you produce a tau. The tau so electron, muon, and tau, they're very similar, just um, different in mass. So the electron is very light, the muon is much heavier, and the tau is even heavier. If we produce a tau, the tau would um, fly a little bit through the ice, but then it would decay. Um, so what you see is like, um, one blob of light from the first interaction, and then the muon flies to the ice, and when it decays, you see another blob. We call those events uh, double bang events. So if you see two of those spherical light patterns in the ice, then it's an indication that this would be um, a high energy tau neutrino. If the energy is too low, the tau doesn't, cannot fly very far, and then those two blobs move closer together, and eventually become one blob, and then you cannot identify it anymore. Then it looks like an electron neutrino. But for very high energy uh, tau neutrinos, you could see those double bang events. And, and we have uh, two or three candidates where we think it's a tau neutrino, but not 100% clear. Very cool. Any other questions? Well, I'll ask one of mine. I was curious about what's advantageous about having ice cube right at the South Pole versus somewhere else in Antarctica. Uh, there's not really an advantage. Uh, well, the, the advantage is that there is the South Pole station. Um, so you have infrastructure. There's a pretty good infrastructure. So in, in summer, they, so in the, in the summer in the south, uh, you have several flights arriving per day. Um, there is a large station where, where the people can um, yeah, can stay, but it wouldn't have it doesn't have to be at the south pole. Right? You only need this huge amount of, of ice. So at the south pole, you have a, a huge glacier that's uh, more than two and a half kilometers thick. Um, but you could you could build it somewhere else. It makes it a bit easier to convert the coordinate systems because you just, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's not a real, that's not a serious advantage. Oh, somebody just asked an interesting question about whether or not there's uh, less ice movement at the South Pole versus other areas uh, in Antarctica. And I'm actually curious about that as well, about whether movement of the ice 
actually affects the location of the detectors at all? So there, there is movement in, in the ice and we, uh, we can measure it. So the whole, the whole glacier moves several meters per year, actually. So there is a, um, uh, the South Pole marker and this thing is, is moved every year, a few meters um, right, to go back to the actual uh, geographic. Uh, South Pole, um, but um, mostly the whole thing moves. So it's not really, there is a, a, only a tiny shear, I think. Uh, so it's not a problem for our detector that like the springs wouldn't break or anything from, from the movement. I have no idea how the ice moves in other places in Antarctica, if it's more or less, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure people who study glaciers, maybe they do know, but I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, how is the Japan's Hyper Kamakande uh, facility different than Ice Cube? Uh, it's much smaller. It's uh, it's much much smaller, right? Because it's also I mean it's a large tank, um, but uh, yeah, it's far away from a cubic kilometer. Um, but they're looking for different things, right? So they are uh, they are smaller in volume, but they have the instrumentation much closer together. So. So they can measure the low in, lower energy uh, neutrinos from, from the sun, for example, or from supernova explosions. So the detectors we have right now, they're really only sensitive to supernova in our own galaxy or maybe the satellite galaxies, but already if you got Andromeda, uh, oh, yeah. the chance to see a supernova there is, is small because... Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Frankoviak? I have one more. Uh, wasn't there a facility that where they were trying to use the mine in South Dakota for a neutrino detector? And is that active or working? Uh, I think that's uh, Dune. Maybe Dune, uh, where the idea is you um, you use the particle accelerator at Fermilab, and then you can produce a neutrino beam that you shoot in that direction. And you have a few hundred kilometers in between, and you can measure the neutrinos. And this is also to measure neutrino oscillation. Um, so there are, um, I think that's a planned instrument, but there is there are some current instruments that um, yeah do this kind of uh, technique to use accelerators to produce a neutrino beam and shoot the, the few hundred kilometers and then uh, measure the neutrinos. And then, uh, yeah, you can measure the oscillation because you, you produce um, neutrinos of one flavor and then you see uh, what, you, uh, what you detect, um, let's say 100 kilometers uh, apart from that. And you learn something about the uh, oscillation properties, about, yeah, about the properties um, of the neutrino as a particle. That's interesting in terms of particle physics, right? They're, as I said, one of the most uh, exciting particles in, in particle physics. Uh, um, another question. This is Mike Adler again. Uh, curious. Um, I think I probably know the answer to this, but. Uh, People are trying to detect uh, you know, the interaction of dark matter, and have looked at, have various uh, looking at uh, various ways of doing that. I'm just curious whether the ice cube uh, detector uh, there's any hope of actually seeing an interaction uh, with dark matter particles there. Um. Uh, I think you, you're probably talking about the WIM particles, right? And 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 what uh, the direct detection of that yes, matter? Yes. They're trying to uh, measure the uh, the recoil. Um, yeah, this we uh, we cannot do. Um, but uh, there are some ideas that the WIM particles they, they could decay or annihilate, and the decay products could be neutrinos. So that's something we're looking for. Um, but we haven't found so far. <laughs> And there's some, some other like exotic hypotheses, um, for example, magnetic monopoles, if they would exist and they would fly through our detector, we could also 
see them. So people look for that as well. Okay. All right. Well, very interesting because the people have been looking for the wimps and have not, uh, uh, I don't think, has seen any effect of them at all ever. There's some question as to whether, in fact, uh, dark matter may not be wimps after all. So. Yeah, there's, anyway, there's other you. models. Um, yeah, I think axions is something that um, um, people are excited about, um, but they also haven't measured any. Uh, axons, I think we couldn't do anything with neutrinos to detect them. But with gamma rays, we could. Um, yeah, Fermi is trying to search for signatures of axions. <coughs> I had one other uh, question. I think at the very beginning of your talk, when you were explaining the, the low probability of a neutrino interaction in your body, you said that a few of them do actually happen through the course of our lifetime. And I'm just curious about what actually results from that interaction. Is there really like anything noticeable that, that changes from a neutrino interaction in our body? Or is it really just like an electron <laughs> gets released and that's about it? Yeah, it would, yeah. I, yeah, most of those neutrinos are electron neutrinos. So they would produce an electron. So you would have a high energy electron in your body. Oh, I will. Um, that happens all the time because they are produced in, in the cosmic radiation. So you, you are hit by high energy electrons at other times and, and you, you do not feel it. I guess there is a tiny chance that it, it's like damaging something in your DNA. Um, but, but the electrons that are induced by neutrinos are a tiny fraction of, of all the electrons that you're hit by other ways. So I, I wouldn't worry about the neutrino interactions in your body. Yeah, we've got much bigger things to worry about, like, you know, huge solar flares or, you know, asteroids crashing into the earth. Um, yeah. All right, well, any last questions before we wrap things up? Well, I, I neglected to mention this earlier, but uh, today happens to be the um, the eighth anniversary of the formation of Wyoming stargazing, which is pretty exciting uh, that we've been around for uh, for eight years now. And uh, so, yeah, thanks for for joining us for our eighth birthday. Um, for Congratulations! The, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I I never knew we'd be uh, doing so much um, after eight years. So. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, but um, yeah, well, um, we definitely have some more World Above the Teton speaker series uh, coming up over the next few months. Um, if you also haven't seen our, our newest uh, show, The Cosmo Show, you should definitely check that out. It's a, a live uh, streaming show that we, we stream on Twitch and, um, and YouTube. And that's on, uh, on Tuesday evenings. Um, beginning at um, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and um, you can um, you can call in and ask your questions. We've got a a, a doctor who studies space medicine. Um, we've got someone who works at the uh, Vera Rubin uh, Observatory, uh, still under construction. Uh, another person who works on the uh, new Bicep uh, Telescope that's um, being constructed, um, also uh, in the South Pole uh, or, or close by. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And then we'll have a, a special guest uh, every week. Our, our special guest this coming Tuesday is Jill Tarter, um, one of the co-founders of SETI, uh, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So it should be a really fascinating conversation. We're just going to be talking about life in the universe. Uh, so join us for that next Tuesday. And uh, I think because there are there are only... Uh, uh, six folks other than um, than Mike, uh, who made all of the astrophotography prints, will uh, will just offer all uh, all six of you um, an eight by ten astrophotography print, um, and we'll skip actually drawing a few names for the raffle. Uh, so if you just uh, take a look at our website um, under the uh, the shop link, so wyomingstargazing.org forward slash shop, 
I take a look at um, all of Mike's incredible astrophotography prints there and just pick out the one you like and just um, email your preference and your mailing address to uh, info at wyomingstargazing.org. We'll, we'll send you a print. And so thank you for being here. And as a celebration of our um, eighth uh, anniversary today, and that goes for you as well, um, Dr. Frankoviak, please let, let us know what print you'd like and we'd love to, to send you one. And, uh, and Mike, thank you for, uh, for donating all those prints to us so we can offer them out to everybody. Um, one of Mike's prints is actually behind him right now in his virtual background, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is definitely one of my favorites. Well, um, with that, um, I'll again just say thank you for being here. Um, really appreciate you tuning in to the Speaker Series event, and we hope to see you next time. Have a great rest of your Sunday, and um, until then, take care. Keep looking up. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See y'all later. <laughs>